All right, so here we are. Oh, you can eat a chip. It's okay. <laughs> all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, Ashley was like, do I eat? Okay. Yes, you can eat chips. You can drink sodas. Uh, here we are at our active school review for art. It is uh, April 8th, 2013, and uh, throughout this lesson, uh, this is a lesson you've never heard of before, so don't worry about uh, being able to answer any particular questions, because there's a lot of this you, you haven't heard of, although from time to time I'll put it into historical perspective, and maybe then, maybe if, if, if appropriate, I may ask some questions. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the trends basically in art today from early uh, of America after the American Revolution all the way up until about, our, well, yeah, until our modern 20th century and, and the art movement of that time as well. And try to put it in perspective again as to what was going on in the country at the time. So starting off, I want to explain to you about neoclassicism. Perhaps we can zoom in on this. Right, so this again, this is a movement that began in Europe. Right, this is a movement that really began in Europe, and it really emphasized uh, visual arts, as it says here, literature, theater, and music. It came from architecture. As the Europeans uh, began to go out into the world and do um, anthropology and archaeology, especially archaeology, and began to look at the ancient ruins, they began to sort of romanticize uh, the old Greek and Roman style of literature and art and theater. And this began this movement in Europe of neoclassicism. Neo meaning new, right? New classicism. It coincided with the Age of Enlightenment at the time period. These uh, philosophers and reason and logic. And it continued on until the early 19th century. It will also then influence Americans. As we'll come to find out, there is no school of art in America during colonial period. If you wanted to be an artist, you would have to go to Europe. And many of these men that we're going to talk about here during this early artistic period in America studied in Europe until we finally get an academy here. But most of them would go back to England and study their art there. Now, as this movement does start to influence Americans, they did add their own sense of American realism to it. And I'll show you what I mean as we go to some of these, these paintings. But it is still a neoclassic uh, movement that's taking place. And then their own little American slant on it as, as they go along. So I am going to go and move along. Like I said, you know, don't worry about that. We'll have plenty of time to see this later. All right, so our early artists. And the first of these guys is John Singleton Copley. Copley lived from 19, uh, 1738 to 1815. Mostly famous for his portrait paintings. You see over there that is uh, um, Paul Revere. And that's Otis, that's Mercy Warren Otis, our first female historian. Uh, over 350 pieces of work was Copley. Very influential. In fact, some people thought he is the most influential of American painters because he's the guy that really influences a lot of others that will follow him. Again, like all these early Americans he studied in England, he puts the he really defines what we would call realist. Americans like to paint uh, realistic uh, settings that were happening in America, especially during the American Revolution, whereas neoclassic artists of Europe would paint ancient Roman scenes. Uh, America will do the same type of art form, but put it in a more realistic setting. He used contemporary history. It's what we'd almost look at it as the beginning of type of uh, news reporting. He would look at some of these situations that are happening. In this particular painting here, 
I have it written down, is uh, Watson and the Shark. Watson and the Shark, 1778. And this is taken from a real situation that took place of a man in the waters and a shark coming and the, and the fishing crew trying to save him. So he's painting realistic scenes that are taking place here. This is right off the coast of Havana, Cuba, where this took place. Now, like a lot of these early guys, uh, because they studied in England, they were mostly loyalists. They were not patriots at the time of the American Revolution. They felt they owed more of their allegiance to England. Copley will go back to England in 1774. And he'll become the first American to be the president of the Royal Academy of Art in England. Very influential. Many, many young artists in America will want to follow in Copley's footsteps and learn this, this technique of art. Again, you, you can understand, for Americans, uh, to them to look at uh, Rome, and Greece, ancient Egypt as a source for their art, it, it really didn't mean anything for them because for them, what they're trying to do here is take this art style, but try to give themselves their own identity. Right? Trying to give them the sense of their own history. So that's why their form of neoclassic is more realistic. It's more about the, the now, what's happening to them and giving them a sense of history as they are a brand new nation starting off. Benjamin West is the next big American artist. Painted mostly historical scenes before and after the American Revolution. He called it his epic representation. Sometimes we call this artistic license, right? You take a real historical event, but as a painter, you can't sit there in the actual field of battle, let's say, and draw it blow by blow as it's actually happening, you then give a representation of how you saw it after the fact. So that's why he called it epic representation. A major battle took place and maybe a, a major moment in that battle and he's going to paint that one moment, but how he sees it as an artist. Again, very neoclassical of him to do this, but it's also very American, taking what would be modern settings. He is like capturing history on canvas for him. He eventually as well, he also is a loyalist and he will stay in England and become the second president of the Royal Academy. Two paintings I'm about to show you in just a moment. The death of General Wolfe, that is in the, uh, that's during, it was painted in 1770, but it's about the French-Indian War. Right? General Wolfe was a young British soldier who rose to the rank of general, and it's at the Battle of Montreal in Quebec where he dies, and the death of Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson is an admiral who fought in the Napoleonic Wars, and he died at the Battle of Trafalgar. Right? Both these men were extremely heroic and very important to British history, and again, he's going to take like a moment, the moment of their death, and do an epic representation on canvas. Not an actual, literal interpretation, but what, what an artist would see, right? Here, let me show them to you. So here you have the death of General Wolfe. And down here, whoop, I went too fast, I'll go back. The death of Lord Nelson. Not very easy to see, I know, because of the light. Um, but again, this is all public domain, so you can easily look on the internet <laughs> and see the clip art for yourself. But again, you can't really say that this is actually how General Wolfe died. Like all these men are surrounding him. Here's an Indian, right? This is the French Indian War. There were Indians on the side of the British as well. Right? They have the flag is here. 
and he's dying this very heroic death. The same thing with Lord Nelson. I right, aboard his ship, and everyone's coming up to see it as he's dying. He's wounded during the battle, and he would not allow himself to be removed from, from the deck of his ship until he knew he had beaten Napoleon's fleet. Now, Benjamin West was not present for either of these. So again, this is his interpretation of history. This is how Americans roll, right? We don't want to paint classical scenes of Rome or classical scenes of Egypt and Greece. We want to do more classical of what's happening now. And for Benjamin West, since he was a loyalist, he painted scenes of British history. Now we'll move into the era of some of these artists who are actually our patriots. This is Charles Wilson Peel. Lived between the years 1741, 1827. He is a patriotic portrait painter. Hmm. Right? He painted uh, portraits of famous American patriots. His most famous are those of George Washington, as we see here. That's George Washington in the, uh, that reddish orange. That's him as a Virginia militia colonel at the outbreak of the French Indian War. That's George Washington, much younger. 1754, give or take. And here we are now in 1776, 1777, George Washington as General of the Continental Army. He was actually a captain in the Pennsylvania militia and actually did see combat. It was Charles Peel. So these other artists, again, painting in that classical, that neoclassical style, but making it more realistic, more of the times that they're living in, giving us a sense of our new history. And that, that's something that these guys were very much aware of. They want to give us a sense of what our beginnings, our history really were. Some of these will go on. Now, so there are some other artists I don't have up here just for, because of time. But another famous clip art I showed you quite a while was the baptism of Pocahontas. Do you remember that? The baptism, yes, some of us remember that. Uh, you can see that in the nation's rotunda in the Capitol building, the baptism of Pocahontas. So some of these painters will go back to early American history as well. But again, it was a, much of an influence. Uh, uh, the influence was on our early history, creating an American nation. And that's what these artists were very concerned in. Gilbert Stewart, the most famous of the George Washington painters. He made really a living out of painting George Washington. Another portrait uh, painter. The one on top is called the unfinished Washington. Can you guess why? It's not, <laughs> it's not finished, exactly. The unfinished Washington. But that's the image used of the American dollar bill. If you look at the American dollar bill, that's the image that we use. The first six presidents all had their portrait painted by Gilbert Stuart. Again, a patriot, someone who stayed here in America and stayed loyal. one here, you, I've showed you several times in class at various clip arts. This is called the Lansdowne, L-A-N-S-D-O-W-N-E, Lansdowne portrait. This is very famous for a couple of, well, for many reasons, really. There's a lot of uh, symbolism in here that I am not a, a, an art history major. I'm not going to go into all the symbolism that's in here, but there is a lot of symbolism. One of the things that's interesting is this is a moment that Stuart is painting where Washington is turning down his third term. In this portrait, he's saying no to a third term. That's what he's trying to say. That's what they're trying to convey here. On the table are two books, the Federalist Papers and the, um, the Record of Congress. 
So this is Washington saying power belongs to the people. Power does not belong vested in one man. So he's putting his hand out as to say no to a third term. This is also very famous because in the War of 1812, do you remember the War of 1812? Yes, yes, we're all shaking our heads. For those of you who can't see, there, there are heads being shaken. Yes, good. Um, and I think we remember what year it began in, right? 1812, right, exactly. Do you remember the moment when the British come into Washington, D.C.? And they begin to set fire to much of Washington, and they do. They set fire to the White House. Do you remember who I told you went back in the White House moments before that happened to save a lot of documents? It's a wife. Yes, it is a wife. Who's the president at the time? It's a James. It's not a John. It's a James. James Madison. It's his wife. Do you remember what his wife's name is? Martha? Martha would be a good guess. <laughs> Martha Washington. No, Dolly. Dolly Madison. She's the one that ran back in, and this is the famous painting that she saved. She had her slave actually break the frame and then have it cut out and roll it up literally moments before the British Army is coming in to Washington, D.C. and starting to set everything on fire. Right. Now, again, so that adds a lot of luster to this particular painting. Why did you choose that one? Uh, because that was the one that was in the White House at the time. That's the one that was there. There were, really weren't any portraits at the time. This was not in the White House, the unfinished. Okay, this, I believe, was in his personal effects at the time. All right, last of these really big, great early artists is John Trumbell. And a lot of these clip arts I'm going to show you in a few moments. We've seen them throughout the year in my, in my uh, PowerPoints. Another guy very interested in painting historical settings of American history. He also was in the Continental Army. He was a major. Now, there was some controversy that took place after the war. Uh, Trumbell was in England. After the war, he was in England. He's an artist. You know, he's there at, at the school. But, it, but a British major in America was arrested for spying and treason and put in jail. So under the English law, they felt you had to, to basically respond in kind. And they found out that Trumbull had served as a major in the Continental Army, so he will now be arrested for treason and put in jail here. Benjamin West is the guy who's living in England. He's the guy that negotiates for Trumbull's release. So Trumbull had this weird moment where he really didn't do anything. It's just, hey, a major was arrested in America for treason. We're going to respond in kind and arrest Trumbull, put him in jail. Now, he has four very famous historical paintings. They're all in the nation's capital. How many of us have been to Washington, D.C. in the Capitol building and where the rotunda is? There's all these walls, and the baptism of Pocahontas is there as well. But these four particular paintings are there. They're a promotion of, again, this classical style of art. All right? Very classical was Trumbull, and you're going to see it in his paintings. He's also very, very conservative. He's a Federalist, right? A lot of these guys became Federalists because, again, they're painting these neoclassical things. When you think of ancient Rome, you think of ancient Greece, there was a very conservative movement in, in those forms of government that they had. So a lot of this painting as well, not only early Americana, early American history, but also a lot of it portrayed very conservative values as well. He becomes the president of a new school now in America, the American Academy of Fine Arts. Right, the American Academy of Fine Arts is finally established here, and eventually other schools of art will follow suit. All right, let me show you these paintings here. Now you may recognize these, right? I think you might recognize them. We have up here in the left-hand corner the Declaration of Independence, right? The signing of the Declaration of Independence. Over here, 
I showed you that one earlier in the year. That is not George Washington. That is Horatio Gates. That is the, the end of the Battle of Saratoga. That's where the British are surrendering at Saratoga. Why is Saratoga important? The turning point of the battle. Turning point of the American, American Revolution. Revolution. It brought France into the war. And what did France give us that was most important? Gunpowder. 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 We desperately needed their gunpowder. Over here, one of my favorites. This is Washington surrendering his sword at Philadelphia. Right? Again, Washington understood the balance of power. Power belonged to the people, it belonged to Congress. Again, it's probably very apropos that in that other painting I showed you that you have the uh, record of Congress is on table. Right? He already had demonstrated he understood when to give power up. He did it as a general. He'll do it again as President of the United States. And then this is uh, the battle, uh, the British defeat at Yorktown. That's Washington in the background. So remember I told you the general in charge, Cornwallis, refused to come out. He refused to officially surrender to Washington and sent uh, a lesser officer. So Washington sent a lesser officer in turn to receive the sword. He would not take the sword from a lesser officer. He saw that as a slight. You have the French army on one side, the British, uh, the American army on the other. That You can't tell what in the background is the British army getting ready to walk the gauntlet as you have would be out here would be the port at Yorktown, and British, British ships have showed up, and you're now going to get, um, you're going to get the British army is going to be allowed to now leave, and the American band is playing a song. Do you remember what song they were playing? The world turned upside down. The world turned upside down. It's kind of mocking the British, right? that your world has turned all upside down. Us farmers have beaten you. And this is what Trumbo wants to show. This idea of the beginning of an American identity and American history and portray it in a really conservative um, type of ideology and yet also very, very patriotic. And that's what you got in the early type of artist. But other movements are happening and eventually more movements will come to reflect a different idea. Romanticism, another movement that's happening in Europe. These are artists and writers. Tomorrow in our literature thing, we're going to go back to Romanticism. A lot of American writers are influenced by this. Uh, music was influenced by this. They begin to put a lot of uh, emphasis on imagination. Emotion, nature, the individual person, and a lot of exotic. A lot of things that were exotic. Foreign, different, right? In, in the literature part, we'll see that tomorrow. This is where America moved from more personal political documents to more entertaining writing. Right? More American theme showed up, and that, I'll, that will be again in our, our discussion tomorrow as well. The early Industrial Revolution is taking place in England, and it's eventually going to come to America. Thomas Watts has invented the steam engine in England. And then we get Robert Fulton takes the steam engine in America. Do you remember what he put it on? He put it on a boat. Right? We're going to get our first steamboats in America. Right? Robert Fulton, the Claremont. Right. This is also not only a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, it's, it says it's a revolt against the Aris, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, also my brain's not working, that always looks good when you're filming, uh, the aristocratic and social and political norms of the Enlightenment. And also this rationalization that emerged during the Enlightenment. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of movement away from the church that's taking place in Europe. Right? A lot of people are going against the Catholic Church. A lot of people are leaving the Catholic Church. When Napoleon comes into power, he tries, because he is very religious, he tries to bring some of that back. 
but the world is too much into the age of reason and enlightenment. But America, remember, America is always going to be very religious, very spiritual. So romanticism is going to play out really nice, especially in our art, in one specific movement that's happening here that's very, very American and American only. And that is what it's come to be known as the Hudson River School. This is an American art movement. Really, I would say our first specific movement that's ours. Very influenced by the Romantics. These are landscape artists. And you should note this, because this often shows up on the AP exam in multiple choice form. Oftentimes, you'll see a multiple choice question. I'll say, who are the artists that painted landscapes? The Hudson River School. Or they'll say, the Hudson River School was very famous for painting landscapes. They reject portrait painting. They didn't like any of that neoclassic look. They didn't like painting people. They wanted to paint nature. They saw that painting the landscape, the pastoral, this idea of the American untamed wilderness that is America, that is the beauty of America more so than a building is. If there are human beings, and sometimes there are human beings that show up in a Hudson River School art, they're nominal, they're, in, they're insequential, they're, they're in the foreground, the background, they're, they're not that important as nature is. And the other thing that, if they ask you a question in multiple choice form, they'll always go to Thomas Cole. He's like the founder of this movement and the most famous of these guys. And here's a Thomas Cole painting. It's simply titled, The Ohio River Valley. And that's what they like to paint. And they like to paint these landscapes Here's a thunderstorm coming in. He's capturing this moment of pure nature. Now they're called the Hudson River School. Where is the Hudson? It's in New York. It's in New York. Now, there actually is no physical school. There is no actual physical school. Hey, we're all going to go study at the Hudson River School. There's no such thing as that. These painters originate out of New York. And the first things that they began to paint were the Hudson River. Thus, they got the name Hudson River School. Within a decade, many other artists will emerge and keep going west. Now think about this time period, okay? This is the time period right after the War of 1812. Right after the War of 1812. We realized that, or I say, I always say we, like I was standing right there with them. The Americans of this time period realized several things. They needed a bank in the United States again, right? Remember, they let the first bank go. We got to have a second bank. They feel very good about beating the British. In their minds, they believe they've won the war. Andrew Jackson's New Orleans battle really has given them a sense of patriotism. Younger men in Congress now, the War Hawks of the War of 1812, especially Henry Clay, is going to seize upon a moment to try and create a national identity. With this new type of thinking, this romantic type of thinking coming to America, a new type of national spirit starts to emerge, and these guys latch on to that. America is creating a market revolution. And where are they going? In which direction? West. They're going west. Right? They're now, because of the British, are going to be kicked out of those forts finally in Ohio. They're going to start heading into these areas they really haven't developed all the way up to the Mississippi River. We have the Louisiana Purchase. Right? That before the War of 1812, we've had that, but not a lot of migration has been heading that way. Now these artists are going to go out there. Right? The manifest destiny moment is happening. And these artists are capturing this 
in painting. This is the American dream. This is the American identity. Going to the untamed West. That's what it's like to be an American. Right? Europe has already developed. They already have their schools. They already have their science. They already have their music. Right? They had Beethoven. They had Mozart. We don't have that. But we had this. We had an untamed beauty that the Europeans did not have. And many Americans of this time period believe that that's creating their identity. Now it all falls apart because of sectionalism. And all falls apart because people want to get into their south versus north, east versus west. But this is that moment where they allowed the romanticism of writing an art of Europe to influence them, but in the way that an American would see it. We're moving west. Market revolution is taking place. Our early industrial revolution is taking place. Transportation is starting to emerge. The American system, Henry Clay's American system, remember what he wanted? What was the American system? What did he want to bring to America? What is he famous for? We're, we're, we're mumbling because you don't want your voice to be heard, I know. What, what, what do you think? If we're going to have market revolution, if we're going to go west, how are we going to be able to do it, Angie? We we're going to build roads, right? We're going to build turnpikes and infrastructure, what, especially with the waterways, canal systems, right? So we're moving west, and these river school artists start to depict that, this American sense of adventure and opening up to new experiences and eventually your manifest destiny, right? But this art eventually goes away as does all artistic styles. And eventually we get to this really interesting moment, the realist movements start to happen. Also the expatriates. Does you know what an expatriate is? You know what that means? These are people who leave their country and live abroad. These are Americans specifically then who went to Europe and joined in with the realistic movements of Europe and then later the impressionist movements of Europe. And that's where they became famous. They, they did most of their art in Europe. These are the artists who come along and reject landscape painting. They don't, they don't think that's really art. These are the three of the most famous Americans of the time period. John Singer Sargent. He's the guy that paints Theodore Roosevelt. That's him. That's John Singer Sargent. He painted the portrait of, of Theodore Roosevelt. He also liked to paint portraits of families. Right? This is oftentimes, students often have recognized this because you see this a lot in a dentist's office or a doctor's office. You see a lot of Sargent's work reproduced in, in some office somewhere. One of my favorite artists, though, of all time, is James McNeil Whistler. When I was a young man, a thousand years ago, when we communicated by clanking rocks together, <laughs> setting things on fire, right? This was one of the most iconic paintings out there. We call it Whistler's Mother, but it's actually studies in gray. Much of, this, much of that particular piece of painting is painted in various shades of gray. It looks like there's a lot of color to it, but there's actually just a lot of variations on gray. And people assumed that that was his mother that he was painting. So he started to call it Whistler's mother. And for a long time, this particular piece of painting was highly parodied. There's a lot of parodies made in American pop culture about it, uh, all the way until like the 1980s. There's another one, I'm going to show you that in a few moments, that is now the most iconic, the most parody uh, piece of art in American history. Art for art's sake. You, know, you don't paint because someone is telling you this is a style. You don't paint because you want to you follow a trend. You do it because you love it. It's part of who you are. Right? Art for art's sake. That's the realist movement. That's what Whistler believed in. Mary Cassatt, another famous American, but she got <clears throat> tied up in the Impressionist movements of Europe. She became an American Impressionist. This idea of you look at something and you look away and you get an impression of it. 
and now you paint what your impression was of it. It doesn't have to be refined. It doesn't have to be straight lines. Impressionists really dislike anything neoclassic. They don't like the Renaissance period. They didn't like realism either, the, re the realistic movements. They were very much, if you look at any Impressionist, it does look like you've got blurry eyes a lot of times, right? But these are the Americans that became very famous during this time period. And again, art begins to change. Also, if you think about it, most of these guys are painting much of their work right after the Civil War. Do you think the Civil War would change how we looked at things in America? Remember we looked at that book a little bit, the excerpts from This Republic of Suffering? All that death, over 600,000 men will die. Not to mention the countless number of civilians, women and children, who are dying because of disease and poverty and sickness and lack of food and water. Americans are very much influenced by that stuff. As we talked, it changed religion, it changed politics, it changed the way we looked at art. Right? We don't want to look at things in a romantic setting anymore. We don't look at things realistically, and the way the world really is. So this is a movement especially that, that appealed to Americans who are tired of the war. And again, other changes will come. The Ashcan School, another very uniquely American art movement. Ironically, their style of painting, very conservative. Nothing really unique or different about them. They, in fact, a lot of it looks like Impressionism. Somebody has a phone or an alarm going off. But they were revolutionary in what their content was. Very different type of artists these guys were. Okay, they didn't, they didn't like the, 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 the typical portrait painting. They didn't like the typical landscape painting of the 19th century. They liked to look at what was we would consider to be ugly. But they looked at ugly and made it art. Right? Or the mundane. That was another thing that I liked. Things that were just boring and you wouldn't think of it as art, they made it art. That's why it's called ash can. And ash can is actually what that word would imply. It's ash in a can. Right? You have a lot of chimneys. And during this time period. A lot of Americans have chimney sweeps. And you have an ash can. You put all that filth and dirt into a can. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at the dirty side of urban living. What is happening in America at the turn of the century as far as the way we live our lives? The Industrial The second Industrial Revolution. Exactly. So what has happened again, where are we now living? Please, louder. Urban. The urban setting. We're going to the urban, the major cities now. Steel has created the skyscraper, has created the expansion bridge. So a lot of people are moving to the urban centers. These people, also known as the apostles of ugliness, or sometimes called simply the eight, they were all in New York City. Right? This is a New York City movement, the Ashcan Art School. Again, no actual school like the uh, Hudson River. It was just these eight men who all started painting right around roughly the same time. They became friends with each other. And then there's this ninth guy who's te technically he is not part of them. That's why uh, I have his name off to the side, George Bellows. He's not actually part of this movement, but he's highly influenced by it. And in some respects, his art becomes more famous. Because he painted a lot of sports scenes. And there's a lot of sports bars that will have George Bellows paintings in their sports bars. Again, they liked the gritty urban scenes. They found beauty in just the boring, most mundane aspects of life. They also saw urban life as very the, the epitome of vitality. They didn't like country. They didn't like that stuff at all. These are city men. They love the city. They love the hustle, the bustle, the sounds, the smells, the noise. That to them was art. So again, this is a very uniquely American movement. I like that they call themselves the apostles of ugliness. Here, and let me show you one, a couple pieces of art here. This one's called the eviction. 
And you see it's almost very, a kind of crude type of impressionist painting. Sometimes it's hard to tell exactly what's happening here. But this is a family that's being evicted from its brownstone in New York City. And he, this Everett Shin came upon this, 1904, and he decided this was a subject for art. Here's the family out, sitting on the streets, as people are taking out all their possessions and throwing it into the streets. Here's a crowd of onlookers. You can't tell, but this particular person here is a very, very light shade of blue. What would that, what do you think he's trying to tell you there? He's sickly. Yeah, he's dying. This is probably a young person, and they're being evicted from their home. Now, the date, 1904. What movement is just getting started in America? The progressive movement. The progressives, right? Remember one of the things that they began to talk about is the horrible conditions of urban living. In 1890, what, uh, 14 years earlier, you had Jacob Riss and his photo book, How the Other Half Lived, right? Where men like the progressives wanted to try to fix these conditions, these apostles of ugliness saw the beauty in what was happening and saw this as art. So they're living all at that same time. New immigrants coming to America, a new industrial revolution, the, the growth of steel, the oil industries, J.P. Morgan and the banking institutions. That's what they looked at as far as their subject for art. That's why, again, no new type of technique is being developed here. Very copied from European style. But the idea of making something that you and I would look at as, wow, this is kind of sad or maybe not a great subject. They saw it as art. That's what's revolutionary. Or something like this, just the boring idea of a woman's work. This is John Sloan, another one of the apostles. Here's a typical scene you would see in the major cities, especially in New York. Right? We don't have washers and dryers at this time period. Hanging your clothes. And if you looked out any typical window in the poorer sections of town, you would just see all these clotheslines hanging from one building to the next. They had a pulley system where they would hang your clothes, pull it out, hang clothes, pull it out, so it reached all the way out. And once it was dry, you pulled it all back in. Who in their right mind would look at this and see art? We would just see this as just a mundane, boring aspect of our normal lives. These ash can people saw this as pure art. Right? This is what was art to them. Here's George Bellows, a stag at Sharky's place. Again, it's a boxing match that's taking place between two men. Boxing was very, very popular in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, all the way until you know, the 1980s, 1990s, boxing was very popular. It's not so popular anymore. What's kind of supplanting boxing today? What kind of fighting? MMA style stuff, right? All that martial arts and mixed martial arts, and that's becoming more popular than and boxing wrestling. is. What's that? And wrestling. Wrestling. Yeah, well, wrestling's always been popular as the fake sport, <laughs> but it's extremely entertaining. Yeah, well, that's a different type of wrestling. That's collegiate wrestling. All right, so we'll move along. We're almost actually through this, so don't worry. Now, I told you, Whistler's, uh, Whistler's grandmother, or Whistler's mother, actually, is what it was called, at one point was the most copied or parody. Do you know what I mean by a parody? Yeah. yeah. What's a parody? It's like, yeah, I make a little fun of it. Like, jab it. Or I use it in more pop culture setting, a more modern set, in order to make fun of something. This one now is the most parody of all. Grant Wood's American Gothic. I'll let you soak that up for a moment, and then I'll explain some things to you. <clears throat> Tomorrow again, we're going to get into literature. There's a new movement that's happening called regionalism, where writers are writing about things that happen in their own backyard. Uh, John Steinbeck is very famous for that. He wrote about all these people that suffered in Oklahoma, right? His Grapes of Wrath, Mice of Men, regionalism, right? Regionalism also began to affect art. 
drawing things that right there in your backyard. Grant Wood is entering a contest. And he loved this barn in the back. That's actually a barn. Students often think it's a church, but it's a barn. Then he got to thinking, as he was going to draw this barn, I think, I think of the people that live in my community. I believe this is in Iowa. He wants to draw the type of people he feels would live in that house. Now let me ask you, what do you think the relationship is of these two people? What, what are these two people? Married. Husband and wife, right? That's what everyone believes. No. But it's not. No. What is it? It is. It, it is not. No. That is a husband. That is a father, and his spinster daughter. What? Huh? Huh? Exactly. That's what a lot of reaction I get. That is actually the father, and what's a spinster? She hasn't been She's never been married. That's a spinster daughter. Is that why he's holding the fishboard? Perhaps. <laughs> and forever, the debate is, well, where is her eyes? What is she looking at, right? What is going on there? There's no symbolism, really, that I'm aware of to this. But it's one of those things like with the Mona Lisa, right? Is she smiling? Is she not? People like to debate art, right? People get really into this. But again, this is regionalism. And this is how things were in his neck of the woods. This is during the Great Depression, right? This is during the Great Depression era. So, you know, this kind of captures a little bit of that. People often see, people see in art what they want to see in art. And people see Great Depression here sometimes. This is also at the time period of something else that's happening out in the uh, western part of the country. That's a terrible, terrible man-made disaster. Dust bowl. dust bowl. Sometimes people see dust bowl images in this. Really neither was he painting it, but again, he would obviously have been influenced by his time period. The funny thing is, you know, an artist often needs a model to, to stand for him. In real life, this is Grant Wood's sister, and this is their dentist. <laughs> That's their dentist that, that stood in pulling that pitchfork. I believe he only had them there maybe a, a total of a day. I don't think he had them posed too long. And it, it won a contest. It has now become the most parodied form of art in, in American history. There are so many different cartoons, uh, different um, uh, images that come up from time to time that you'll see of people standing. And sometimes I've seen presidents from George W. Bush to Barack Obama photoshopped here, right? People like to parody this piece of art. American Gothic. 1930, by the way, I should have told you the date. 1930 is when this was uh, produced. In the 1930s and 40s, America really, you know, we're going to the Depression, but we're in the New Deal now as well, right? The New Deal. And Roosevelt is always about the can-do, right? The positive, look on the positive side of life and all this can-do legislation. And Americans really liked that sort of stuff. And there was a lot of romantic ways of looking back at your past and Americans being strong and being able to overcome. And nobody really typified Americana art at this time period than this guy, Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell, again, another very, very famous artist. but. Unlike a lot of artists who put things to canvas, he put most of his stuff to magazine. Magazines were very, very popular at this time period, and this is the Saturday Evening Post. And exclusively, Norman Rockwell drew all of their covers. And there are a lot of very, very famous Norman Rockwell cover uh, art to the uh, Saturday Evening Post that's out there to this day. A lot of other real artists at the time did not like Rockwell. They saw him as very simplistic, uh, that he, he wasn't really telling anything important. But Americans really like this. Do you remember we talked about the four freedoms? That's the one on freedom of speech. I think I showed you that clip art uh, earlier in the year. You had freedom of speech, you had the freedom to worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. Norman Rockwell drew all of those, right? 
He would, from time to time, um, get involved in civil rights. He was very pro-civil rights. By the 1950s, remember, government isn't getting involved in far, as far as Congress and the President. What branch of government did get involved? Judiciary. The Supreme Court, the judicial branch, right? And here you have a, a young black student trying to go to school, and these are men who are actually protecting her to get in. And the name of this piece of art is The Problem We All Live With. Right? The Problem We All Live With. He's speaking out against racism, although, again, people often missee this and think of this as a racist thing, because he does have, you can barely see it as the men are walking by, there is the N-word here. Okay? But again, he's trying to show a mirror to society of how wrong this is. But oftentimes we don't understand art and we, we see things that aren't really there. Mm -hmm. Now this next one isn't an artist. But I find this movement very fascinating. And this is when photography now is also going to explode in America. And Ansel Adams, one of the foremost photographers in American history. Look at this picture. That's a, that's a photograph. It almost looks like a painting. He loved, obviously he lived in black and white. That's his, that is his, um, what do you call, uh, it, um, his domain he paints in. No, there's that actual other word I'm thinking of. Uh, it'll come to me later in the night, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's, this is where you know, he specializes in. Uh, he's an American photographer. He's an environmentalist. Mostly, most of these pictures are from Yosemite National Park. This is called the zone system. You, you, I'm not a photographer. Is there anyone in class who dabbles in photography, really understands photography? <laughs> from time to time, I have students who are very into photography. Uh, there's a way of exposure, you know, the way you have your apertures on, on your camera, on your lenses, how you expose the light. Photographers really understand that. And he has a certain way to expose light in contrast to what the final print will look like. The group they call themselves is called Group F64. And again, unless you're a photographer, you don't understand that. That's an aperture setting on a camera lens, F64. And that's the setting that this group used for when they uh, had their exposure of light into their camera. Again, you would have to understand photography, I guess, to really appreciate that. Uh, last couple of years, I've had several students who actually were photographers themselves and recognized that immediately. Um, Yeah, it's a small aperture setting on a large format camera, is what F64 is. It's a small aperture setting on a large format camera, is this F64. Right? You, have, you, know, you have these lenses and it gets smaller, so it's, it narrows the light coming in. So you have a certain exposure of light when you take a black and white uh, photo. And this became a whole movement in America. There are a lot of famous American... Um, photographers now that will merge because of this. And then art starts to get into the more modern, and to me, the surreal and the bizarre uh, abstract expressionism, Jason Pollock. Right? This is where you take a giant piece of canvas, and Jason, Jason Pollock, there he is, you just take a paintbrush and go, lip, 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 lip. Jackson Pollock. I'm sorry. Well, it's right there, Jackson Pollock. Um, I like to call this the bowl of green spaghetti. I'm sure it's called something else. <laughs> um, this is where people will look at this. These are the kind of people who go, well, clearly this is an expression on modernism and the failed industrial revolution and how it's brought mankind uh, to its knees, you know, and some other guy will stand off to the side and go, no, 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 no. Clearly, this is the state of our political failures as the middle class has tried to rise and could not get to a certain height. And then I would be in the center just going, it looks like green spaghetti. I don't know. 
I don't see that. Um, abstract. Everything in the abstract. And all of a sudden, art in America changes forever. Right? There are people, uh, there's a woman, I never remember her name, she's very famous for, she's a modern artist, she gets a giant canvas the size of our classroom here, puts paint all in giant troughs, and then she rolls in it in the nude, and then she rolls all over the canvas with her, with her nude body. And that's become, she's famous for doing that, okay? Um, that's abstract expressionism, right? That's where art has changed for us today. Also, another guy who's changed art for us today is Andy Warhol. I don't know if you've ever heard of Andy Warhol. He coined the phrase, everyone gets 15 minutes of fame. How is a can of Campbell's soup art? Well, why not? Why not? Exactly. Why not? He uh, came famous. He took, he had a picture of Elvis, and he created eight Elvises from it, and then painted over it. Uh, the last time that sold, it sold for over a hundred million dollars. Right. Andy Warhol was shot and killed. <laughs> <laughs> by one of his followers. Okay, no, Andy Warhol is not still alive. <laughs> no, he was shot and killed. Um, and that's Andy Warhol right there. But again, if you think about it with the abstract and then with Andy Warhol, the 60s, what has gone on? World War II has come and gone. But then America got into that Cold War period, right? America got into the Cold War period where we weren't always sure if we were doing the right thing. The conservative conformity of the 50s was trying to tell people just follow the line. But there are always people going against the norm. Right? Betty Friedan is going to write her feminine mystique. Right? Uh, J.D. Salinger is going to write uh, Catcher in the Rye, a very provocative book. Right? There are always people who are trying to go against what they think is conformity and say, no, America's not always right. And that's where you get expressionism. That's where you get like the war all the 60s. We got the Vietnam Wars going on. Right? So art is going to change because of this, because of what's happening in our society. Right? The New Deal values, right? we have Norman Rockwell, we had a Grant Wood, that's all New Deal. And all that stuff we said prior to that, all that is indicative of the time period you live in. Today, art can be anything, because Americans are so fragmented now, right? Politics has shaken since Watergate, we have less trust in our leaders. Uh, Television and morality has come into play since the 60s. What is obscene, what is not obscene. When I was a young man, again a thousand years ago, you could not see a commercial at all with a woman wearing a bra. They sold bras, they advertised them on TV, but you never saw it. Then there's this moment in the 80s where they had this commercial where a woman wore a shirt and the bra over it. Right? That was the first time it began to change. Now look at what you see with the Victoria's Secrets. Right? There is no secret with Victoria's Secrets. Right? Art also changes like that as well. Rena? Uh, did any of these artists like, experience censorship? Well, as far as the early stuff, no. Right? All the way through the 18th, 19th century, there's going to be critics. There's always going to be critics who don't like what they see. Um, as far as censorship, when you got into the provocative era, uh, especially for the 1950s and McCarthyism, you do have to be careful. Are you doing things that seems, you know, communistic, right? That seems Bolshevik in, in, in a lot of respects. So there could be some censorship there. It was just bizarre for a lot of people more than anything else. Those, were, stock laws, like, ever, like, those things ran out, out by the time of the mid-20th like, century. And the Supreme Court, I think it's 1962, but again, I know I'm taping myself. I'll have to double check, but there's a, there's a court case where the Supreme Court judge has that famous moment he talks about pornography. He says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it, where he says, I don't know exactly what it is or how to define it, but I know it when I see it. And that becomes the rule of the Supreme Court. Right? You know pornography when you see it. And basically, pornography has to be something to elicit sexual desires that are unnatural. In our modern world, where does Playboy fit? Playboy is highly censored at one point, right? Hugh Hefner is arrested at one point for publishing Playboy. Today, it's part of the pop culture 
mainstream America. But other magazines are not because they go way more to the graphic. Right? So art changes with society. You know, what is what is normal one decade is considered out of date the next. What is sensational one decade is considered way out of date the next, right? What we might think was hardly sensational in the 90s, even. Today is just commonplace. All right, well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. And we'll go ahead and we'll turn this off.